Hello, I'm Matthew Bransgrove. I'm John Dickinson. This is part one of the private mortgage lending series. Today, we're going to talk about what is private mortgage lending. John, what is private mortgage lending? Matthew, private mortgage lending is really an individual providing money for a mortgage as opposed to a bank or a major lending institution. That's primarily what a private loan is. So if we just think about an individual or an individual's company providing the capital for a mortgage or they're investing into a mortgage opportunity. So their name goes on title? Correct. So their name or, or ultimately, typically their company name would go on title as the lender. So I think if we just very easily think about an individual lending the money on a mortgage as opposed to a bank or a major lender, that is primarily the foundation of a private mortgage. Okay, so we're also talking here, John, about uh, you do a title search and you see the name of the lender on the title. Correct. So they are taking a first mortgage or sometimes second, but almost always a first mortgage position over that property directly. And, and essentially that is a private mortgage. As you know, Matthew, they've been around a long time. This is not a new thing. Um, private mortgages have been around forever and a day. I think you said it dated back to historical times, didn't it? That's right. Yeah. Date, dates back to the uh, ancient Romans were there taking so, um, mortgages over each other's houses. There you go. So that's how, how far back it goes. And very, very popular. It wasn't all that long ago that many legal firms around Australia were actively lending in private mortgages. They would have clients uh, that had money and they would possibly have clients that wanted to borrow money and they would essentially put the two together and facilitate a mortgage and, and wacko there's a private mortgage. Yeah, John, they've um, pretty much been regulated out of existence. Correct. And uh, Correct. I think it's a good thing. Mm. Uh, and what I'm talking about is that back in the day, uh, the solicitor would get a call from the broker. Uh, he, he'd be sitting behind a desk and he'd make a decision on whether or not that was a good deal or a bad deal. And then he'd put a bunch of clients in it, usually a contributory mortgage. Correct. Um, and the problem was those, those loans would often go bad. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think if you look at that scenario, that sums it up very well because that's quite a conflict, isn't it? When you've got a solicitor acting for all parties. I, you know. I, well, I think the conflict arose because the solicitor was taking uh, a chunk of money, mm -hmm. uh, an, an establishment fee, as well as his legal fees. Correct. Um, but more than anything else, he was making... Uh, the decision whether or not to lend. Mm. Um, the decision whether or not to lend, I think there needs to be a check and a balance. So there has to be a deal killer somewhere along the line. Mm. Mm. Um, now, I'm obviously a private mortgage lender solicitor. Yes. And what I do is kill deals if I if I, if I smell the slightest whiff of something that I don't yeah, like. Yeah, because your job's to protect the, the lender, the investor. My job's to protect the lender. Mm. Um, my job is also for the lender to make money. Mm. Uh, so I'm not going to kill a deal that's a wonderful deal. I take a long view because I make a small amount of money on each particular loan, whereas I make a lot of money over the years from each particular lender. Sure. If I have a lender who loses money and then uh, dips out of the uh, lending game or, or, or sues me and I've never been sued, um, then what I what I've lost is a lot more than what I would gain. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas um, a broker, uh, no offence to yourself, John, you being a private mortgage lender's broker, mm -hmm. I think has a, a bigger incentive. Um, not a huge, because I think you're looking long term at the uh, lender as well, but you've got an incentive. Your job is to, if you like, um, to get the goal through the posts. My job is I guess as goalie almost, mm. if it's a bad deal. Mm. I mean, I, I let the good deals come through. Uh, and then sitting in the middle is the actual investor. Sure. And what we're talking about is private mortgages where the investor takes an active role and makes the decision whether or not to invest. Yeah. And I think that's a critical distinction between what we're talking about, private mortgage lending as it exists today, yes. uh, versus the old school solicitor loans or the newfangled managed investment mm, scheme. Very different, yeah, exactly. And I think, Matthew, we should also touch on what a private mortgage actually looks like because a lot of people think about a mortgage as a 25-year or 30-year 
mums and dads sort of residential mortgage for a property to live in. And that's a stark contrast. Certainly not that. No, it, it's, okay. it's the opposite of that. It, so it's, we're talking yeah. to people who have never heard of the concept Correct. today. Correct. Um, so one year term yep. is typical. Typical. Um, when I say typical, 99% mm -hmm. of all private mortgage will be 12 months. 12 months Correct. For, for some bizarre reason. Yes. Yep. Uh, and interest rate? At look, the moment, yeah, John? look at ranging. I mean, pressure on rates typically as we stand is down, obviously, with what's going on. But I find from a private investor's perspective, they can expect anywhere from 8 to 10 percent on a private mortgage, yeah. depending on the transaction. I think my experience is that there's a hard floor for private mortgage lenders. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to be uh, listening to what the Reserve Bank's latest manoeuvres are. Mm. Uh, the hard floor seems to be around about 8 percent. Mm -hmm. So a private mortgage lender simply will not get out of bed for less than 8%. Mm -hmm. The reason is there's so much work involved, which we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about we're that. We're going to talk yeah, about absolutely. that. Um, and then on the top end, I think that the highest I've seen private mortgage rates are somewhere around about 11 or 12. Yeah, on a first mortgage, I think that's right. Um, obviously, there are some investors uh, or lenders look at second mortgages, different, different, different kettle, kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, but on a first mortgage, I think you're right. I think they tap out at around that 12% mark. Um, so if we look at, say, 8 to 12%, that probably encompasses that range right. of, of, depending on the transaction and the risk profile of that loan. Okay, so um, within that range, there's fluctuation based on the risk profile. Mm. Uh, within let's say a vanilla loan. So mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, inner suburbs, very nice house, yep. okay. it's complete. Yep. Um, yep. What, what would you see the fluctuation in interest rates? Look, I think on a, yeah, so I think, well, it's, it's, it's been vastly different over the years actually, um, because a lot of it does depend, even though you said that the investor isn't really focused on what the Federal Reserve is doing, I think they have to be focused on what the market is doing. Um, it, 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 yeah, but it's, it's the relevant. private mortgage lending market. Correct, of what that's doing. And, and yeah. that seems to be driven, um, from what I can see, mm. a lot by uh, the liquidity situation with the banks. Yes. In other words, let's say the banks are lending at ridiculously low interest rates, mm. like they are at the mm. moment, mm. 3 or 4%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're not lending to certain types of people for certain types of deals. Mm. Um, and it's dried up completely. Correct. That means the only place they can go is the private market. Yeah. And there's a lot of competition in the private market, meaning that there's limited funds uh, and there's lots of borrowers. Yeah. And that tends to drive it up. Yeah. Uh, I, it's about demand, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and I think that at the moment, I've probably never seen a more healthy environment for a, a private mortgage lender or an investor. Um, I think that we've got a situation where the, the main... The, lend, the main banks uh, and prime lenders have really tightened up their lending policies. Yeah. And I think what that's caused is a lot of very, what I would call bankable transactions, very, very good transactions from a risk perspective that, as you said, are turning to the private sector for support, where in years gone by, even 12 months ago, 24 months ago, the banks might have written that loan themselves. So what that means for the investor is I think they're enjoying a very good return given the risk profile of what they're investing into. So I think it's a great time for private mortgage investors at the moment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you would say that you're. you're well, I you're think a it's. Broker. I think it's fact, and and I, I tell you, I'll back but at the that. same time, yep. um, super good deals are mm. thin on the ground. What would you say to a lender who rang you up and said, "I've got five hundred thousand, John. Mm. I want to get it out tomorrow." Mm. What would you say? I would say let's not do that um, because it's five hundred thousand dollars, and we want to make sure it's protected. Okay. Yeah. But how long until you be able to, on average, mm. find? I'm not talking about how long it takes to settle the deal. Yeah. But how long until you can, you, on average, would you expect him to wait before you ring up and say, here's a great deal? Oh, look, I think, um, and we'll get to this on the next series, part of my job is to filter those opportunities to make sure those only the cream or the good deals are going to these investors. But look, I find any, anywhere from a week to, to four weeks. Um, it depends because sometimes I'll get a run on where I'll get three or four very good applications in the door this morning that we can yeah. facilitate. Other times it might take me a number of days to weed through some other opportunities until we get that one that I think is a great opportunity. So it, it can be up and down a wee bit. But I would say to an investor, just take a deep breath because yes, getting a return on your money is very important, but being protected and safe is really important, yeah, right? right? So I think that let's not just rush into any transaction. Let's make sure we're putting that money to something that's sound and valid and supported and is ultimately going to be a, 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 they want their money back as well as the interest, don't they? So that's important. I act for a young guy 
or he was young when I first started acting for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, I think he was in his ver very early 30s when I acted for him, but that was about 20 years ago. And he inherited a chunk of money. It wasn't huge, mm. um, but it's increased about 20 fold. Yes. And he started off doing first mortgages, then he became more and more sophisticated, uh, started doing second mortgages, started doing construction funding, um, mezzanine funding, mm. which is second mortgages on construction funding. And he has a philosophy, which is uh, it's the loans you don't do yeah. that give you success in private mm. mortgage lending. Mm. I, I really think that's right. And, and I think that, um, you know, I will often get brokers calling me. In fact, I had one just yesterday where there was super urgency about the transaction. Um, John, can you settle this in four days' time? Do you need to get a valuation on the properties? All these sort of questions. And, and you know, my immediate response to that is no and no. Um, no matter how good the return is, no matter how good the deal appears to be on paper, unless you're doing the right things and, the, and we're helping the investor to protect themselves, we shouldn't be doing that transaction. I understand. Yeah. Um, private mortgage lending is, though, much, much more flexible Correct. and dynamic well, than that's... banking. And, and one of the reasons people go to private mortgage lenders is that they can uh, not so much turn, turn on a dime, mm. but they can turn on a, let's oh, say, a basketball look, court instead yeah. of a football um, field. Look, if we look at, at the, 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 the nature of a private mortgage product, it's, it's, it's very different to a bank again, where, where banks will bog themselves down in uncopious amounts of paperwork and often look at bank statements and tax returns and all these things that may not be even that relevant to the transaction and spend months or, doing it. Or may be forged. Or may be forged. All sorts of things. Where a private mortgage really is, I'm not saying those things aren't important. Character is important of the borrower, ability to service, all that's important, but primarily it's about the asset. Have you ever, have you ever had a private mortgage lender who's poured over someone's balance sheet? No. No, no, um, because <laughs> I it, haven't. Yeah, because it's about it, it's primarily about the asset. It, 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 yeah. It's what I would call a sensible credit policy, starting with the asset, because as you know, Matthew, when the dust settles, if something does happen, all that's left standing is that asset. Right. We can have piles of paper that don't really mean much anymore. So, you know, that gives us the ability to be able to react quickly. Not days, you know, we can't sell yeah. these things in days, but we can certainly react very, very quickly compared to a major bank. Okay, yeah. so um, I, I'm just thinking from our viewers' perspective, we've mm. talked about the paramount importance of the asset. Mm. I, I guess that's, that's um, uh, understandable. If things go wrong, uh, the buck stops with the, with the value of the property. Yes. So that's absolutely essential. Yes. But we, as uh, private mortgage lending professionals, me as a solicitor for mm -hmm. private mortgage lenders, you as a broker for private mortgage lenders, mm. uh, we like the quiet life. Absolutely. So we don't want push ever to come to shove. No. Push does come to shove. I would say one in 20 loans, mm. push comes to shove mm -hmm. um, in varying degrees. Mm. So uh, they might stop paying their interest. Maybe one in 30 ends in an actual mortgagee power of sale. Yes, yes. Um, those aren't insignificant numbers. And if you're a private mortgage lender and you're at the game for any reasonable period of time, so let's mm. say five to 10 mm. years, you're gonna have a mortgagee. It, it will happen. It Absolutely. will happen. Absolutely, yeah. And um, like Caesar's legions, uh, you're gonna to need to be blooded mm. before you'll feel comfortable with mm. it. Um, mm. So, so uh, when, when something does go wrong, obviously the first time it ever happens, first time you ever have to file for possession of security, you'll be, um, as a private mortgage lender, uh, ringing up John, ringing up Matthew, going, oh my God, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. oh my God, is this really happening? That's I right. can't believe this is really happening. After yeah. you've done it 10 times, you probably won't even ring up. No, no, you, you won't just monitor the emails. Exactly right. And, and look, that's one of the reasons with a private mortgage that the loan to value ratios are typically light compared to a major lender. Right, I mean, banks are running 65%. 65 is typically where we're at on a first yes. mortgage. And I mean, banks are running around doing 80s and you know, 90s. That number, I always wondered where that number came from mm. uh, because it's, it's universal, it's mm. convention, mm. but it's not in the law. No. Um, but you ring someone, you say, I want a first mortgage, yeah. They'll say 65%. Yeah. The Trust Act many years ago had a provision that trustees investing in mortgages could only lend to 65%. Mm. Now, I'm not sure if it came from that, but as a rule of thumb, it seems to be that the loan goes into default, uh, the, the borrowers are scallywag and, 
and causes all sorts of trouble mm. and delaying actions um, mm. and hijinks in the court. Um, I don't know, you you fall over Christmas, so you can't auction the property over Christmas. Yes. You've got to wait until yes. February. Yes. When all those um, unexpected uh, vicissitudes are thrown in, if you're lending at 65% LVR and you're getting penalty interest during that whole period, mm -hmm you're still going to walk away Absolutely. comfortably yeah. uh, with all your money. Correct. And, and I think, Matthew, the, you know, n none of us want to sell properties. We're not real estate agents, and that's not what we want to do. But it happens, as you say, it does happen. The, the net result, most of the time for the investor, is they actually do better financially out of that scenario than... But we still don't like it. We still don't want to do it. That's right. But, but it's and we don't actually act for lenders who want to do that. Correct. We, that's so not if a lender we says, that's give right. me... And there are lenders out there who do it. Um, I know a guy who talks, I, I, I met him at a conference, he said, we go after good, bad loans. And mm. I said, what do you mean? Mm. And he said, we look for uh, people in a situation where they're going to go into default so we can pick up on the penalty. Mm. Uh, he was a construction funder. Right. And he'd take over construction jobs that were bad, yeah. uh, but they'd, they'd have a whole lot of back-end fees so mm. that if it did go into default, uh, they'd really clean up yeah. and essentially strip the equity. Mm. But there are um, you've got to be geared up for that it, it's got to be geared up yeah. but they're also i want uh, uh, not to sound too um sort of squeamish there are ethical difficulties uh with doing something like mm. that oh, um, oh, re I, and reputational yeah, difficulties yeah, i agree and that's not how any of us want to live our lives i mean i think at the not end how of the i want to live my life same here and i think at the end of the day what we want is what you want and it's what the investor wants we want the investor to get a good return and the borrower wants. And, and the correct, and the borrower, but ultimately we want the investor to have a good return on their money. And, and a safe return. A safe return and a trouble-free investment. That's and that's right. ultimately what we that's want. Right. And we, we want the borrower to get what he wants. Correct, it's gotta be a win for everybody. It's gotta be a win for everybody. That's right. Um, so we want the quiet life. Yes. Uh, we, we meaning you and I, yes. and, and me and any and other brokers. And the that investor I, too. Yes. Yeah, and yep. the investor. Um, well, well, not always, mm. um, because I've had investors with whom I've parted ways because they had a different mm. uh, philosophical approach. Mm. Um, the, the, let's say the interest rate of 9.5 is not attractive enough to them. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's, that's that. that you know, well, that's a different profile. That's again. a different profile. Yeah, it's a different profile. So, um, look, I'm happy acting on second mortgages, mm. um, you know. And, and but not unless the person's reasonably sophisticated. I think you'd have Correct. to you'd lend on private mortgage for about five years mm, before you until you're going to go there you're again. Go different there. risk profile, um, different sort of investor, and when there's trouble, there's more trouble with seconds, obviously, exactly. and the returns bigger. Uh, well, the yeah. thing about a second is you can be faced with a complete and utter loss. Correct. Uh, if you've got a first mortgage over a property, and uh, let's say the market dips, now uh, in the wake of the GFC, uh, the most recent. Mm -hmm. um, mega disaster, I'll call it a mega disaster, extreme disaster. Uh, property prices in the western suburbs uh, dipped in some areas 30%. Yep. Uh, close to the ocean, anything within about five miles of the ocean uh, was fine. Mm -hmm. It tended to mm -hmm. plateau. Yep. Let's say uh, you had loaned on one of those properties in the western suburbs on a first mortgage. Mm -hmm. Disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the property market went down and uh, for whatever reason you couldn't sell the property, let's say it was a half completed development, yep, yep, you had to yep, finish it, et cetera, yep, et cetera. Yep. You wouldn't be left with nothing. Correct. It, it wouldn't be a complete write off. Correct. It's not like you've invested in a publicly listed company that's, that's right. gone into and liquidation. Now you've got a bit of paper. That's and right. now you've got a bit of paper worth nothing. That's right. You've still got real property. Mm. I think that's very important for investors to understand. Absolutely. This is real. Yeah. It's not, well, it's, it's bricks and mortar, but more important than the bricks and mortar, is uh, the the section of earth that you that you own? Correct. It's 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 um, it's land, mm. and that land is going to go up in value at some stage. So if you can sit on that property, for example, uh, for five years, you'll find that it'll return and exceed uh, the price that you need to get your money back. That's right. Um, That's you right. may not your your return may not be um, flash hot over that period, mm. but you're not going to get wiped out. Correct, yeah. And that's about taking a sensible position over the security of property, isn't it? And that's really where I think the loan-to-value ratio kicks in. You know, if, if we start with a good property in a metro area that is not specialised, it's just a 
nice residential house or a commercial property, we lend a sensible loan to value ratio on that, so say no more than 65% of our valuation, not what someone else thinks it's worth. Yes. Then that's a fairly, we'll get on to that. We'll get on to that. That's a fairly comfortable place to begin, I think, from an investor's point of view. And as you've always said, regardless of the market, the property has an intrinsic value. Exactly. And the, and, the, and the investor, because they have a registered first mortgage over that property, has that value. So it's, it's not likely to be a wipeout. It's okay. likely to be recoverable. All right. Now, this being introduction. Yes. Introduction to private mortgages. Why don't we talk very quickly about the process, mm -hmm. just so uh, people who are new to the concept can get their bearings. Private mortgage lending begins with uh, an, in, uh, an application uh, to yourself Correct. as a lender's broker, Correct. either direct from a, a borrower or from more often than not another broker. Yeah, correct. So essentially what would happen is we would have, we have a number of introducers. We will talk about this more obviously in the next section, um, but we have a number of introducers that would talk to us about an opportunity they have for their client. So their client wants to borrow money and it starts there. So we would find out what they want to borrow the money for, a little bit about the client, what the security is going to be, and we would form a picture of what that investment opportunity is. And you do some desktop investment. Correct, we have some, we have a look at, does that, that, does that all make sense? Do we, we look at the property value as a desktop initially yep. to see does that stack up? We would then essentially put together a loan snapshot for the investor and then deal with the investor directly. We would say, hey, listen, okay. we've got an opportunity here that we think warrants you'd have a look at what okay. you think. So that's your job, roughly, um, and we're just talking roughly at this mm -hmm. stage. It then goes to the investor, and the investor's job is to evaluate the security. That's the primary that's right. uh, job. That's right. So when, when you say you send them a valuation, and we'll talk about this in more detail, yes, obviously, yes. later, yeah. uh, they can't rely on that valuation. It's no, a guide. no, correct. And it, it, evaluation, I think, should be the best way to describe it. It's a great place to start. Right. So in, it's an essential document. Um, it lets us know a lot about the property. There's some methodology behind that valuation that we'll get into later. Um, but it can't be solely relied upon. I think the main job of the uh, of the investor or the lender is to evaluate themselves the value of that security and we're property. Boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. I don't think there's any other any other way to do it. I, okay. I, I think that's critical. Well, that's my understanding. And mm. hand on heart, mm. in uh, more than 20 years in the in this business, I have never seen. I'll just say this: hand on heart, after more than 20 years in the business, I've never seen a first mortgagee lose money when they inspected the property. Yeah, I think it's a critical part of the process. I really do. Okay, because value, valuers don't always get it right. No, they don't. And when I say inspected, I'm talking about not just looking at the property, but going and speaking to two or three of the local real estate agents. Mm. They really understand their own. Correct. Yeah. yeah, arguably better than the valuer, because the valuer might not be from that area either. So it's a critical part of the process. All right. So if you're new to this and you've never, ever um, thought about private mortgage lending, uh, you should understand that I often get pushback from investors, they say, Matthew, I'm a busy man. I've got a, I've got a plumbing business, I've got uh, my factory. I just can't drop everything and go and look at this property that John wants me to look at. That's when I say, I'm not really interested in acting for you mm. because a fool and their money are soon parted. That's a critical part. You can't do it over the, uh, by um, uh, Google searching, mm. uh, realestate.com searching, core logic searching, all of that's very good, mm. but you've got to go and speak to the local real estate agents. Those local real estate agents would starve if they didn't know the value of their um, uh, lo local real estate. Mm. Whereas the valuer, he's flown in, he, he could have done half a dozen all over the, all over the city, mm. and he's flown in for 10 minutes, that's right. he's, he's done a few quick photographs, and then he's shot out of there, and he's written up this report. Correct. And um, whilst that may be good for the banks because they play the numbers, as a private mortgage lender, yep. you can't afford to have a valuation that's out by 20 or 30 percent. No way. Because you're talking uh, a loss of capital um, uh, as well as uh, interest, a loss of interest and perhaps a loss of capital as well. Correct, which nobody wants. Nobody so that's wants. a critical part of it. Then the next stage, John, is my job as solicitor. My job is to document the loan mm -hmm. and you do legal due diligence. So I certify to the lender that they're going to be able to sell that property for that amount of money 
if they put that amount of money in my bank account for that particular loan. Yes. Now that's very important and there's a huge number of things that uh, we do and I'm going to go into that in some detail. Well, I think we've done a whole section just on that, haven't we? We have indeed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are 154 items on my checklist. Mm. Uh, each time it gets uh, refined and refined some more. But if uh, that's done and the property, if it was a good deal introduced by you, it's a good security, they're more than 65% of what's being loaned yeah. and they're able to sell it uh, if push comes to shove, they're going to get their money back and they can sleep Correct. easy at night. Correct. So really, when you think about it, investing in a mortgage is analogous to buying the property themselves. Yeah, correct. And I think you've always put that quite well, where the question is, would the investor be willing to buy the property for what they've lent on that loan? And I, th and I think that's a, a sensible way to look at it. That's right. Yeah. So it's different from would you be prepared to um, buy that property for what it's been valued at? Mm. It's actually lower. It's, it's significantly lower. That's yes. right. It's, that's right. That's right. And I think, Matthew, it's... In other words, there's a buffer. And that buffer is the registered proprietor's equity in the property. Correct. And, and I think as the investor... If, if we're dealing with a, a good metro uh, property that is high quality, not specialised, if we were to say that would you buy that property um, for 65% of its value, the answer is yes, pretty I would. much yes, I think I would. It's a good bargain. That's right. That's right. The, the critical part is what is the value and, and that's what we need to determine. And not only that, instead of getting a miserable 4.5% return, which you would if you were investing in the real estate yep. directly, yes. you're getting, let's say, 9 or 9.5%. Correct. Uh, Correct. And, and, and the trouble, if you like, is the fact that instead of buying that property forever, which is what you did if you're a property investor, mm. uh, you're really only buying it for one year and then you've got to start all over again. That's right. Exactly. So you have the broker's job, which is to introduce the loan. Correct. The investor's job uh, evaluate the security, make Correct. sure it's worth yep. what it's meant to yep. be worth. I've got to be happy with that. You've got the lawyer's job, my job, which is to certify title uh, and ensure that the property can be sold ultimately. Correct. So to summarise, there's the broker's job, which is to introduce the loan. The lender's job or the investor's job is to evaluate the security and the solicitor's job, which is my job, to provide the due diligence on the uh, legal side of things and ensure that the property can be sold if push comes to shove. Correct, correct. So John, one thing that we should just touch on lightly before we wrap up today yes. is the difference between a coded loan and a non-coded yeah, loan. Yeah, I agree, because that's critical, because with private lending we are talking always about non-coded loans. That's right. So for those of you who are, who are not aware, uh, when we talk about the code, we're talking about the National Consumer Credit Code, or NCCP, um, I think is the official name of the legislation. And it deems a lot of uh, investment loans to be investment loans in, in real property by individuals to be consumer loans uh, and protects them. Uh, so it is a little bit dicey. But the rule of thumb, which is it's, it's a, an ironclad rule, mm -hmm. is if the borrower is a company, it is not a coded loan. Yeah. And I would say, Matthew, that 99.9% .9 of the transactions that we support, it will be a company as the borrower. Right. It's quite, I can't even remember the last one that wasn't. That's right. So that's primarily what we would do. And it also has to uh, pass the, 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 the smell test. Correct. If you like. Correct. Uh, so when I look at it as the lawyer, I want to know about the company. Mm -hmm. I want to know what it does. I'll, usually I Google and I have mm, a look. Mm. You can put up a fake Google page, but uh, you're not going to put up a fake Google page that's going to fool me. Mm. You know, I'm going to look at it. Mm. I'm going to see it. Yeah. Um, if the guy says he's into mind pump equipment, I'll ring him up and talk to him that's about right. mind pump equipment, that's ask right. him who some of his clients are, perhaps get some invoices sent mm. through, mm. whatever I need to do to make sure that is a bona fide business. I agree, Matthew. And, and we can also look at um, things like date of incorporation, can't we? Well, yeah, so that's if, if it was all part last of last week, then we might look at that. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And that's really my job mm. in the 
in the final analysis and your job as gatekeeper. Correct, 100%. All right. Well, I think that's pretty much... I think we've covered it. We've covered it. I think so. Well, thank you very much for joining us. That is the first in our series of private mortgage lending. Uh, and tune in for more detail later on. I'm Matthew Bransgrove. I'm John Dickinson.